All right, so I know a lot of folks, Dave, are in the audience and they may, may have experienced Bleacher Report in the, the freewheeling days of user-generated content. It's been 10 years since you started this site with your co-founders, but a lot has changed since you were founded. You employ professional sports writers, you've gone heavy into social, you're now obviously part of Turner. Give us your 60 second or more elevator pitch on Bleacher Report in 2017. What's working? And what do you feel you need to work on to keep improving? So Bleacher Report these days and has been for, for years now is the second largest sports media website in the United States for, for the last three or four years. Um, but kind of at the time frame, we realized that that's not really the business we wanted to be in long term. We didn't want to be in the, the website business. Um, we, uh, we wanted to be in the brand business, and we really set out to focus on, on building our brand. And since that time, we've become the largest uh, social sports voice property, whatever, however you want to describe it, in the United States by an order of magnitude. So our, our brand is engaged with across social platforms more than any other sports brand um, by far. Um, our, our largest Instagram account is the second most viewed Instagram account in the world from a video views standpoint. And our strategy has really revolved around, and the reason I started Bleacher Report in the first place was to create a sports, really, voice for a younger generation of fans that I, when I was in college and getting this thing off the ground, um, I felt like my peer group was kind of stuck with my dad's sports brand, with my grandfather's sports brand, that was just really out of touch with how a generation of people viewed sports in their, their lives. So we've obviously come a long way since then. I want to get into all of the, the social and the branded content and also the competition with ESPN. Uh, but first, it seems like over the last 10 years, the prototypical Bleacher Report reader or viewer has shifted from somebody sitting at their desk, browsing on, a, on the web, to someone sitting in the living room or in the stands using the site as a complement to the, the in-game experience. It's gone more mobile, it's gone more social. What's changed for you and for Bleacher Report as a result? What have you learned about the, the best way to serve that person with content? Yeah, I, I think in the last 10 years, the entire kind of world of sports culture has been disrupted. And I think it's been disrupted by, by what you mentioned, um, by, by mobile phones and, um, and by social platforms. So the extent to which uh, I think like what sports means in people's lives these days, if you, if you think about it in real terms, like I, I think sports, especially for men, if just being honest in the United States, is it's really a universal language. It's a 24-7 it's a activity where you have millions of guys who are looking for the next curated piece of sports content to share with their group of friends. And um, that fuels interaction and conversation. It's like the backbone of how men relate to one another. And that actually becomes more important in a lot of cases than watching the game. People have so many different entertainment options these days, whereas like when I was growing up, um, you probably watched more um, of your local team's games because there was just less other stuff to do. You didn't have your Netflix shows and your Amazon this and that. And like these days, there are just so many different things going on in your life. And, uh, and so I think the role that sports plays is just a, it's a little bit different for the younger generation than it was for older generations. So we've, we've really embraced that and that's, like that's why our content shared five times more often than um, than any of our other competitors, right? It's it's just a different way of thinking about the industry. I'm going to push back a little bit on that uh, on the gender issue. You know, some of the most intense sports converse conversations I have are with the women in my life. Is there a, an opportunity there for you guys to grow by appealing to a, a broader set of readers? So how do you view that? Yeah, I mean, I. Women certainly make up a large percentage of our audience as well. I think the reality is that the that type of consumer behavior is more prevalent in men than women at this point in time. I do think one of the cool things about kind of the rise of mobile and, and social is that you, you now can be connected to sports uh, without necessarily kind of giving a damn about wins and losses. Like you can see a really cool video of something really athletic and it could be a professional sports highlight or it could be like a 13 year old Japanese skateboarder doing something amazing and it's just as an 
as a vehicle for, for reaching audience and influencing audience if you're an advertiser, I think sports in some ways can be a more effective vehicle going forward because some of the walls have fallen down. Like it's, sports are a little bit more inclusive these days just because sports content reaches way more people than it used to because of stuff like that. Um, I think in that sense, like you've got to design content specifically for an audience and not, like it's, it's pretty clear that there, there've been a number of like women's sports oriented initiatives or um, that, that haven't worked over the, the last 10 years. And I think um, we've just tried to be honest with ourselves around why, why have those strategies not worked and what, what strategies would be more effective. So that's certainly stuff we work on on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's go back briefly to that living room experience. Right now, if someone's watching on TV, uh, largely the experience on their phone is disconnected from that TV. We've seen some uh, blurring of the lines with things like the Twitter streaming of the NFL, where the, the mobile and the viewing experience become one. How do you see that experience changing over the next two, three, five years, that the bridging of the, the viewing of the game and the social and the media supplement to it? You know, it's interesting. I think leagues are going to try like hell and continue to, um, to have those things bleed together uh, because they'll make more money if they're successful doing it. Um, I'm not that big of a believer in those types of experiences. I think one of the, um, the great realities around how people consume sports content these days are when commercials come on, most people are on their phones, right? Um, when, uh, when something boring is going on in a game and there are a lot of dull moments in sporting events and where like, younger audiences especially have relatively short attention spans, they're a moments-driven culture. If, if there isn't a moment that's going on that they can talk to their friends about or that's kind of getting them off the seat and feels like just another play in a game, the odd, odds are they might be on Instagram or on Snapchat or doing something else. And I actually think maintaining that flexibility for consumers and having the ability to go switch to other things is more important than supplementing the game experience with something that can be very hokey. Uh, so I think that's just the reality of what leagues and media properties are dealing with. Like you have to, you have to really understand what real consumers are actually doing, not kind of hoping and praying they're doing something that has, is gonna work two out of 100 times. Is there one league that's doing it best, in your view, in terms of understanding the, ro the proper role of social, uh, doing it right in terms of perhaps separating the stream from the social? Ha yeah. Who's doing it right? I mean, the leagues all have different strategies. Like, I would say that Major League Baseball's strategy is they, they tend to wait until they can monetize something before they push any audience towards it, um, versus the NBA, I think has, uh, has more of an inverse philosophy where they, um, they'll make sure that they go wherever audience is and they'll, they'll enforce their rights because it's good um, business for them to do so, but at the same time, they think of social as, uh, as a great marketing platform. And like, if, you, if you look at maybe the, you know, the 50 most famous athletes in the United States, um, how many of them are NBA players right now? Like a very, very high percentage of them. How many are Major League Baseball players? Maybe, maybe zero. Um, maybe one. I mean, and that to me is crazy and an indication of kind of where sports is going culturally. So to me, like you've got to be front and center and market your players. And if you're not playing in the spaces where people are spending time, um, good luck to you. From a business perspective, do you view the leagues as competitors on the media side or partners on the content side? For the most part, I. Um, I don't view them as competitors on the media side. We don't, we don't really truly compete with them for ad dollars, kind of that, but every once in a while, but not, not usually. In terms of competing for attention spans, I'd say certainly, but we as a business have, I, I would just say, have been able to focus more on one thing, which is engaging consumers, and they tend to be focused on 20 things, and this is a very small revenue stream for them, and I think the reason we're kind of so far ahead at this point is, is probably just because of our ability to focus and specialize and constantly be learning lessons about what people want and what they don't want. We just, we move faster. All right, let's talk about social, which is something that's going to resonate with everybody in the room regardless of their position. Bleacher Report has taken a very specific strategy. If I understand it correctly, you're focusing on three social platforms primarily, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, 
or at least that was the case the last time you spoke publicly sure. about this. Yeah. How is the strategy working? How do you think about those platforms in relation to your main site, and where do you make money? So what I have more of an NBA philosophy, which is wherever, wherever users are, wherever there are people who are fans of athletics and the culture that surrounds it, I want Bleacher Report to be there, and I want people to have a really positive experience with it, right? Like we're, we're in the business of building a brand, we're I think over time gonna be able to monetize the brand in lots of, of different ways. Uh, the thing about social platforms that I think some people misunderstand is, you know, with Facebook and Instagram in particular, um, you can sell branded content into those platforms. So that, that means that you know, we can essentially sell advertising, we have to follow certain rules that I think are very healthy rules for users. Um, but we can sell sponsorships, we can collaborate with brands on content, and then we can basically have that content run in a distributed way, which is how users actually like use the internet and use their phones. So we can run a campaign that runs across Instagram and runs across Facebook and runs across Twitter, runs across our own properties. We have a massive mobile app. And that's a pretty effective monetization strategy. And for, for an advertiser, like these days, it's, it's so easy for, for marketers to just give Facebook and Google money. Like it's the, everybody knows about the duopoly. They eat up 80% of ad dollars. And they, and they probably should eat up a large percentage of ad dollars, if I'm being honest. Like they have amazing first party data that, uh, that no one else has. Um, but I would argue at the margin, maybe brands are spending a little bit too much there. And maybe if you think about when you're on Facebook, like how often do you really stop and look at ads or how often do you just scroll right by them because it's super easy to do so um, versus what we offer is because people share our content at such a high rate, um, like a really, really high rate relative to anyone else in the industry. Um, for brands that really want to influence our audience and need to influence our audience, whether they're a newer brand off offering a disruptive service of some kind or whether they're an older brand that you know, used to have tentpole marketing strategies and run commercials on television and that's, that's how, and associate themselves with Michael Jordan or whatever they did in the 1980s, that strategy is not gonna work anymore for younger generations. So you have to find different ways of influencing audience. So our play is really to be the most influential voice for this entire generation of fans and then bring the right brands into the fold who can basically figure out how to leverage that. That's a really important distinction because a lot of media brands look at social as a way to drive the audience back to their website where they then can monetize it. That's not how you look at it. And it puts you in a unique position of strength from a business perspective. Yeah, I think that the, the days of being able to drive massive referral traffic back to your website are like, they're, they're coming to an end. They're coming to an end because Facebook, uh, has kind of decided that it's best for them for you to stay on Facebook as much as possible. I think F Facebook's all about user experience, but maybe they're also all about getting you to view as many different ads in newsfeed as possible, right? So if you think about the decisions that they've made, um, they, uh, they promote video very heavily, um, native video very heavily in newsfeed. They, they don't promote posts that link out very heavily. So it's, it's a slog to get traffic out of there, whereas, um, when they were kind of getting publishers addicted to Facebook in the 2013, 2014 timeframe, it was really easy. So they've made it harder and harder over time. Um, display advertising, that market is flat at best. Uh, I think more and more advertisers are, are kind of realizing that it might not be the place where they're gonna put more of their dollars. So those two things come together and I'm, I'm not sure that uh, I, like I would say there are a lot of publishers right now who are kind of in deep trouble because they're just not positioned that well to make the pivot. And yet it's a double-edged sword if you're relying on Facebook for, or other social platforms for a lot of your revenue. In fact, you just tweeted, this was a reference to a story that came out on Facebook looking for high quality video from a lot of publishers. You just tweeted a couple days ago, Facebook treats publishers the same way Bleacher Report treated unpaid writers in our early years. The model is not sustainable. I know you said Facebook is kind of a frenemy. Are they more friend or enemy right now? It's, um, it's a really complicated question to answer. I think it's, like, it's not a black and white issue. I, th I think that like Bleacher Report, and I, like, I tried to start a media company with no money, which is kind of crazy, and so we, we arrived at this model where we aggregated bloggers and people who are already writing about sports for free or college journalism students, and then we kind of 
progressed over, over time as we were able to scale our audience. And I think Facebook just needs to go through a similar progression where they've kind of sold publishers and, and in this case athletes and a lot of different third party content providers on the value of their platform. Um, they, I think, need to deal in terms of harder realities a little bit more and make sure that there's actually uh, long-term benefit to being a part of their platform versus uh, kind of promises of things are going to get better, things are going to get better, and then you know they kind of kick the can down the road. What could they change specifically, Facebook in particular, to make this a better platform for your business? Uh, that's a that's a good question. They they could do a lot of things. I think we'd like them to do a lot of things. They uh, they could be better about sharing data, for example, um, and data specifically, like they're very good at sharing data if you pay for traffic on their platform. So that's kind of one of the tricks is if you pay for the traffic, you get really good insights about the audience are reaching. Um, if you don't pay and you're relying on your organic audience that you've built up yourself with your own blood and sweat and tears, you don't get the same quality of data. So I think there, there are things like that where they kind of push you into funnels to say, hey, spend more money with us that I think when you just add up the economics, you're going to have a lot of publishers go out of business or um, they're going to cut content that maybe is more journalistic in nature because that's usually the content that's kind of uh, has the worst bang for its buck. And so I think I would just encourage them to think more long term about what they're actually doing to the publishing industry in an honest way and not just always think about kind of their own uh, internal KPIs. Like they're, um, they're a gorilla in the space and they, um, it, they're impacting a lot of different things in this country. See, a lot of other publishers would look at that dilemma and say, okay, I'm going to stay away from them. I went to a business journalism conference a month ago where if you had gone up and said what you were going to say, you might have been booed because those, th the main focus was how do we cut Facebook out of the equation? And I realized you would look at that and say that's backwards. That said, Facebook, those, those readers of your content are their customers, not yours. H how do you feel about them controlling so much long term? So my view is we have to play in both places. So I'm, I'm very fortunate. I have a very large direct audience as well. Um, and a lot of publishers don't. They have a lot of passerby traffic, but they don't really own an audience. We do, but the audience is not nearly as big as Facebook's audience, right? Like, di like completely different. Like I, I have a lake, they have an ocean. Um, if, if I'm not playing in the ocean, then I'm not attracting more customers myself. And so they are still the most effective way for us to reach audience consistently, like I, I just think that if you're not uh, if you're not present in a in a really compelling way, where uh, where the, I mean we're trying to reach a, a wide wide number of people where they're spending time, then it's just good luck to you. It's just um, it's just really really hard. Yeah. Last question here on social. You have faced some criticism from other sports journalists in particular about the content that you do on social diluting the brand or making uh, Bleacher Report less substantive. How do you respond to, to those criticisms? Um, I don't know if I really need to. I think our social content stands for itself. We have, I, I think we have pretty clearly the best social sports content that exists on these platforms. Our engagement numbers are much higher than any other player in the space. We, we have a long-form editorial journalistic division called BR Mag that I think is um, is one of the best place to read compelling storytelling about sports in the space. And so we um, we have a portfolio of different content that we create that spans video and text and social. And I don't know, I'm very proud of our content at this point, and I think the numbers kind of speak for themselves. Do you look at the social component as journalism or marketing? It's both. I think it's, it's hard to distinguish between yeah. those two at this point, yeah. Let's talk about the on-field experience and the in-arena experience and how that's going to interact with media over the years. As you know, obviously sports in general is something that you're passionate about, you've looked at for many years and you started the site for that very purpose. As you look at the way professional sports in particular are playing out and the fan experience, given what you know about your audience, which is the future of their audience, what are the professional sports leagues doing right? What are they doing wrong? What needs to change? I think it's pretty clear that uh, that this 
I think there's been a lot of short-term optimization in certain sports where you've got, uh, you've got ownership groups that have focused on you know, driving year-over-year year, year year growth of cash flow, for example, and they've said, okay, last year we grew by 8%, and then their teams get a target to say, hey, this year we want to grow by 10%. And so you get all of this stuff that they do that kind of squeezes the experience where you get, um, it gets more commercialized, uh, the kind of the, the, some of the purity and quality of elements of being a fan just get a little bit worse every year. I, I think the NBA, by contrast, you have a lot of newer owners that think about the valuation of their franchise and think, hey, I, you know, I bought this franchise for $450 million and now it's worth $3 billion. Um, let's keep investing in the long-term future of the brand. And I think that type of thinking leads to better consumer experience. So I, I don't know if it's for me to say, you know, do this or don't do that, but certainly younger viewers will substitute towards other things a lot more quickly than their parents will. And I think if you burn them through crappy user experiences and too many commercials or uh, too much kind of dead time during games, or just frankly, you know, by having halftime shows that are targeted at their parents or whatever it is, um, they're going to substitute towards something else. So uh, some things will need to change. What about things like augmenting the play on the field, either at home or through augmented reality in the stadium? sensors in the, in the game balls. How far does technology need to go to engage this new generation of sports fans? I think they're, like augmented reality, for example, um, everybody's gonna go like, we're gonna do this, everybody will, will figure out at different points in time how to create uh, AR filters that'll be fun for people to play with and based on the hardware and platforms that exist, they'll be shareable and like, to me, that's fun and additive. I'm not sure it's a game changer. And I think a lot, like a lot of these things that people are trying right now, I view as, as probably things that niche audiences will appreciate. But um, I'm not sure that I see AR as something that's transform transformative for a sports audience. Uh, I don't, I don't totally get it yet. Um, but we'll we'll see. Okay, I've got a couple other questions, and then we're going to open it up to, to the audience here. You've, you told me when we talked last week, fantasy is not catching on with the core Bleacher Report audience in the same way that it has with older generations. How are you adjusting for that? What's, what's the future of, of fantasy uh, play and fantasy sports coverage? Yeah, it's interesting. So, I mean, it's not to say that young people aren't playing commissioner-style fantasy games at all. It's just less, less of them are... And I, I think it, fantasy is probably, NFL fantasy is probably peaked. I think it probably peaked three or four or five years ago and is, is slowly dwindling. Um, it's hard, I think, for young people to get, you know, to get 12 of their friends to do the same thing. Um, I think that's why one of the appeals of daily fantasy is that like, it provides a lot more flexibility. It's, it's more short term. So I, I do think that there will probably be further disruption, sorry, in that, uh, in that space. And it's something we spend some time thinking about. But, uh, but I, you know, if I had the answers to that question, I, um, we'd probably be, be building them. And right now we're not. Yeah, is it about an evolution of fantasy or is it about something else that comes along to replace it? I mean, ideally, betting would just become legal, and then like we could really go and get after it. But I think that's what we're all kind of waiting for, right? And I, I think if that uh, if that happened, then kind of the the sky's the limit. You can do all kinds of things. Esports is there an opportunity there? I know you, the Bleacher Report does have coverage. I was looking at it this over this past week. Largely aggregation, uh, not a lot of original reporting in the esports realm. Yeah. What's the future of esports media coverage? So right now, the, the audience overlap between esports and traditional sports is, um, is actually super low. And it's something we monitor closely. We kind of have a, we've dipped a toe in the water just so that we're, we're learning and have, not that we're smart, um, you know, based on the two previous gentlemen that were, were on stage, um, but we're, we're in the game a, a little bit and learning. I have a couple concerns about whether esports will kind of break out in the mainstream. Um, I don't love that so far it's been difficult to build celebrities kind of out of the players. That seems like the shelf life 
of an average player is pretty short because players players burn out. Um, I don't know if the other the guys who were just here would dispute that, but that that seems concerning to me. Where in so many sports, a big part of the model is building the brand of the players and leveraging their celebrity. Like if you look at the UFC. Um, which is obviously a very successful business, but it, it did kind of tap out from an audience standpoint, or at least that's how, how I view it. They, they really built their brand on the backs of, you know, of a few fighters. And in this last wave, and what really got their business sold is they had Conor McGregor and they had Ronda Rousey. And I, that, that concerns me a little bit about like whether you're, um, whether you're ever going to be able to kind of break out of this bubble or if it's just going to be this really good like very monetizable business, but of a relatively small group of folks at the end of the day, but we'll see. Questions for Dave Finocchio of Bleacher Report. I've got, I could go on for hours. I think we have time for one question if anybody yeah. has something. All right. I think there's one actually in the way back. Is that all right? Hang on. Yeah. And, and while, while we're running, he's running back there. Um, well, <laughs> okay, well, we'll get it. Uh, you talked a little bit about how you wanted more data from Facebook. I was just interested in what that is, what you're looking for. I think first and foremost, uh, I, this might be this might be too granular, um, but we run uh, we run advertising campaigns where um, where we want to be able to target certain audiences, right? Um, sometimes that's our entire audience on Facebook. Sometimes that's uh, that is um, a subset of our audience. And right now, whereas you can get demographics on a specific post, um, it's, it's really difficult to get, uh, to get strong data across, um, across a series of posts. Or like basically if you, you, know, you have 10 different posts you're doing as part of a campaign for Dick Sporting Goods, um, the quality of data we can get if we do that organically without paying Facebook is not the same as, um, as what we can get if we we spend with them, um, so I I think there's some things like that that would just make the uh, this business kind of more sustainable versus Facebook kind of squeezing publishers' margins at a time when uh, when the traditional sources of their revenue is already kind of dissipating because Facebook's also squeezing that. So it's they're they're trade-offs, but I would just wish there was a little bit more consideration for the long term versus kind of salespeople running around saying, hey, we gotta hit our numbers this year and we're gonna do that at all costs. That's kind of how it feels as a publisher at times. Final words for this audience, Dave, for somebody thinking about the, the future of sports technology, what would you want them to walk away with in terms of their understanding of Bleacher Report or the future of, of sports media? I think, for me, number one, it's just really embrace the reality and look at the data. Um, look, at, um, look at how much time is being spent on mobile devices and how much time is being spent on social. And I, I just think that the path to success, specifically around content, whether it's a subscription business or an advertising business, um, is, uh, is kind of through that mobile social lens because that's where people are, are spending time. So just like look at what you're doing and what your kids are doing in, the, in their day-to-day -day lives and, and really think about it um, because the paradigms um, are uh, maybe a little bit different from how a lot of people in the sports industry are still choosing to run their businesses. And uh, if they keep doing that, they're gonna get disrupted big, big time over the coming years. Dave Finocchio, CEO of Bleacher Report, thank you very much for being here. Yeah.